Hi friends, welcome back to another episode of Generation Tech. My name is Alan. So before we begin today's episode, which is part three of our Separatist Alliance versus Earth series, I want to talk to you guys about something uh, that's pretty important. If you guys didn't know already, it's been a month since the YouTube advertising boycott started and we've been hit pretty hard. I mean, it seems like all the videos that feature things like violence, war, and politics are being flagged, even if they're mostly Star Wars related. Now, the Versus Earth series we've been doing has lost about 75 to 95% of its usual ad revenue, and even our Star Wars Zombie series has been hit with ad censorship. Now, me and Ben, we love doing this channel. I mean, I, I stay up until 5 in the morning editing these so you guys can see them the next day, and we want to continue doing this full time, but this advertising boycott has really hit us hard, and we don't know what the future holds for YouTube, so we want to diversify our revenue stream so we can continue doing this and supporting our families. And we really hate this idea that now advertisers can force us to create content that they deem is safe and approachable. Me and Ben have both worked in the TV and commercial industry and we like YouTube a lot more because there's this creative freedom and the only people that really do matter are your fans and your viewers, not some, you know, ad executive. So guys, we're going to be setting up a Patreon account where you guys can help support us by donating to our channel. It could be as little as a few cents, guys. Every donation will really help us a lot. And uh, there's a reason why we spend so much time and effort on our videos. Uh, we don't always just want to be sitting in front of a TV screen. We actually had a bunch of different projects that we had planned before the boycott hit us. And unfortunately that sidetracked it, but hopefully with enough revenue, we can basically carry out and do some interesting documentaries and some other creative stuff that I think you guys will really enjoy. So guys, if you want to help us out, head down to the description and hit that Patreon link. Thank you for your patience. Here's part three. At the end of our last video, Earth and the CIS are entrenched in a bitter stalemate. Earth's remaining forces have scattered into small resistance groups which are constantly harassing and raiding Separatist outposts. CIS forces are satisfied with remaining within their own security zone as long as their agricultural shipments keep going off-world without any problems. A cryptic message from the organization Humanity First had been circulated on military radio frequencies across the world. The message included a set of coordinates for the Central Droid Command Center and a date coordinating the attack, May 4th. The only problem was that it was in the middle of the ocean. After first contact, the majority of Earth's nations welcomed the CIS with open arms. Eager to benefit from these visitors' new technology and trade, many nations allowed the CIS to open and operate outposts in their territory. After a series of attacks were carried out against these locations, the Separatist Alliance landed security forces to ensure the safety of their scientists. As tensions escalated across the world, these research outposts became forward operating bases for the CIS military. A few nations refused to allow the Separatists access to their country. Ironically, Japan, known for its advanced robotics industry, was one of them. Because there was no Separatist base in Japan, the country on a whole was relatively untouched by the war. Their leaders had been careful not to provoke the Separatists, and they were reserving their military strength for when an important target presented itself. A target like the Central Droid Command Center. At the time of the CIS invasion, the US, the UK, India, and the Philippines were carrying out joint military exercises. After losing contact with their central command, most of these commanders wanted to return home. So far, Japan's domestic travel had been unaffected, but several Japanese airliners on international flights had been shot down by vulture droids. They were restless and eager to fight, and now they finally had a mission. The message from Humanity First couldn't have come at a better time. The coordinates pointed at a location in the middle of the Pacific, just 100 miles east of the island nation of Kiribati. It was nearly 5,000 miles away from Tokyo. The coalition of forces immediately realized that sending any sizable naval fleet was out of the question. Anything with an engine larger than a speedboat was immediately fired upon by Separatist ships blockading the planet. The Separatists had a very advanced sensor that could track heat and electronic sensors worldwide. They even could detect vehicles underwater. The Japanese Navy had lost several subs in the earlier days of the war in scouting missions. No one knew what was hunting their vessels, but several crews had reported something large latching onto their hull, followed by a high-frequency squealing noise before losing contact. The new tri-fighter droids introduced by the CIS were decimating Earth's remaining air forces. They were much faster than the older vulture droids and extremely difficult to take down. Even so, an air attack seemed to be the only way to reach the target without being destroyed. Japanese analysts predicted only forces from Australia, New Zealand, and Hawaii would have the capability to carry out an attack. 
With Pearl Harbor and the majority of the American Pacific Fleet being wiped out in the opening hours of the invasion, it is very possible that the combined air forces on the Japanese mainland were the only ones capable of striking the Droid Command Center. Japan had been stockpiling civilian-grade plutonium for decades, but it had the self-restraint not to make nuclear weapons out of them. Japan understood the power of nuclear energy better than anyone. But once the invasion began, the Japanese began enriching their plutonium, and just a few months ago they had finished their first two hydrogen bombs. They had two shots at this. The Russians had attempted shooting an ICBM at a Separatist battleship in orbit, but the point defense weapons on board along with the shields prevented any major damage to it. Depending everything on one single airstrike was quite risky. A Filipino naval captain had approached the coalition commanders with an interesting idea. A few of his officers had all come from a fishing village before joining the Filipino Navy. They proposed building a banca. It was quite a small ship, but able to travel great distances because of outriggers on both sides. And better yet, it could use sails or a small engine to propel itself. If conditions were right, they could make the trip in a little over two weeks. Hopefully, they could make it without being detected and walk straight through the shield and into the Droid Command Center. After some serious discussion, it was decided a joint strike squad of Indian Marcos, British SBS, and US SEALs would make the voyage together on a fleet of a dozen Banka ships. Team 1 would carry the nuke and 11 other teams would carry conventional explosives in case they failed. A secondary strike team was centered around a Kawasaki C2 transport plane. Japan had banned the creation of offensive weapons since World War II and had no strategic bombers. The second strike team would coordinate its attack with the first strike team in case it failed. On the morning of May 4th, the first strike team had reached their target location. The journey had been rough, but the Banka boats had held up. No one knew what to expect, but looming ahead of them was a gigantic dome in the middle of the ocean. What remained of the human resistance was ready around the world to launch a massive attack on all Separatist outposts once the Droid Control Center was destroyed. Everyone on the planet was depending on this strike team. There were no visible defenses around the dome, but it was clearly shielded. Small docks were visible at ground levels at several locations. The boat split up and each one headed for a different dock. Team 4 was in the lead. Suddenly, a huge metal machine over 80 meters long jumped out of the water and crashed into the boat. All around them, Separatist Trident-class assault ships began ripping boats apart. Team 7's boat was hanging in the air. It had been speared through by one of the squid machines and abruptly disappeared in a giant explosion. The Indian commandos aboard must have detonated their chargers. By the time the boats entered the dome's protective shield, only four vessels, including Team 1, were left. As they reached the dock, several droidicas rolled out to greet them. The SEAL commander of Team 1 looked at his boat captain. He said to him, full speed ahead. Several thousand feet above them, Japanese airmen watched the detonation unfurl. For a second, a shimmering field contained the explosion. But as the generator was vaporized, the shield failed, and all the energy it contained came rushing out. Idaho wasn't known for much besides potatoes before first contact with the CIS. But after they came, the state saw a booming development and quickly became home to one of the largest Earth Separatist co-op farming operations. But that was before the invasion. Now the entire complex was walled off. Anyone who came within 100 yards of the wall was gunned down. But today, members of the 54th Idaho Militia Regiment stood just outside the perimeter of the wall. Many of the 54th had been farmers or field hands in the very complex they were about to assault. The strange Japanese fellows on the radios had told them that the defenses were about to come down, but no one believed them. There wasn't much room for optimism when you're dealing with a technologically advanced killer robot army from space. But their captain, Reven, had told them to trust the message, and the 54th trusted him. No one knew much about the captain or where he came from, but he sure knew a lot about killing tinnies. And he was right again today. For some reason, all the droids on top of the wall had become deactivated. The men of the 54th quickly scaled the fortification. Walls without defenders were just an inconvenience. Tonight, they were going to eat like kings on the right side of the wall. Within hours, Americans had taken over the largest CIS operation base in North America. Captain Reven woke up abruptly. It was past midnight. He sensed something was wrong. He felt movement all around him outside. The 54th weren't alone. All of a sudden, blaster fire ripped through the air, striking sleeping militiamen. The droids had reactivated outside. Reven had hoped to keep his identity a secret to his men. There was no knowing what they would do if they found out who he was. To them, he would just become another outsider, an alien. But if he was going to get out of this situation, he would need more than just a gun. 
Well, guys, that's all I got for you today. I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you really did, please check out our Patreon campaign. We'll link it in the description below. In our next episode, Ben will be back covering all the ships in the Republic, and I'll be bringing you guys the final episode later on this week. As usual, thanks for joining us. If you're watching this, you are the Resistance. I mean, Generation Tech. Well, you guys can be both. Why not?